Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our webinar. Um, and thank you to Foley Hoag for um, joining us to provide insights on, I know what is a very uh, complex issue, the Massachusetts Paid Family and Medical Leave. Um, you'll notice on your screen that there is a chat. Please, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to write them in there at any point in time. Um, we're going to keep this somewhat um, conversational. I, I realize um, it's in mute, but um, please go ahead and type messages. If anybody's having any issues at all, um, type them here. You have the opportunity to include the entire audience, or if you would prefer just to let myself, I know it says Mackenzie Flynn, Sarah Frame, um, so to let myself or um, Aaron know any questions or issues that you're having for, for hearing us or seeing anything, um, you also have the opportunity to just um, send your chat to organizers and panelists only. Um, with that, I don't want to take up any more of this very valuable time. So I am excited to introduce Erin Olson, associate at Foley Hoag, who is going to spend the rest of this time going over the issue and answering questions. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here, you know, this afternoon. I know you, I'm sure you have lots to do. Um, to talk about the Massachusetts Paid Family and Medical Leave, um, first I want to give a caveat that as confusing and you know complicated as this law is, it's continuing to be confusing and complicated and we're continuing to learn new things every day as they develop regulations and guidance on things. So big caveat that you know, stay tuned for future updates. Um, I've literally given this talk before or given advice on this law and the same day, the Department of Family and Medical Leave issues uh, a new regulation or new guidance saying exactly the opposite. So um, <laughs> caveat that unfortunately the answers uh, might change or, or might become more concrete as we move on. So for today's agenda, I simply wanted to go over the origin of this law, sort of what the basic moving parts of it are. Hopefully some of you or all of you are familiar with this law and have had to deal with it already since it's started coming into effect in October. Um, but I think that's a good place to start, uh, sort of address coverage questions, who is eligible, contributions and deductions, what the benefits look like, how the benefits interact with different leave laws, um, and especially the most complicated question I think is you know the exemption application option that's available under this law. So um, after that you know I'll address a few ongoing issues that uh, are coming up and, and can be expected to be coming up in the near future and then um, to the extent you have remaining questions or, or things that you want to discuss about this law it'll sort of be an open forum at this point. Before I start, just a little bit about me and Foley Hoag. I'm an employment lawyer from Foley Hoag, which is a 280 attorney firm. We're based here in the seaport in Boston, and that's our largest office. And we've been in Boston since 1943. But we also have a growing New York office as well as offices in Paris and Washington, D.C. Um, and we're, we are a full service firm, but we really focus on being the best at specialized areas uh, where we serve clients and so we tend to focus a lot on on areas that are significant to the Boston market like intellectual property and um, uh, you know emerging companies and and those sorts of practice areas and I I've really can't say enough good things about working at Foley um, and being able to collaborate with all these different areas of expertise um, it's been really a great experience anyway PFMLA as you probably know, uh, this was passed in summer of 2018, and it was passed as part of a grand bargain in the legislature, which included several different aspects of employment law, such as an increase to the minimum wage, elimination of Sunday overtime. All of these issues were expected to be 
ballot questions and they were expected to be successful ballot questions. And at the same time, even though they were ex expected to be successful, it was also expected that they would be very costly campaigns for both sides to put on. So that sort of context, I think, shaped a lot of how this law has come into being and how, how we've seen it implemented so far. Because when they passed this law, they were trying to pass it, A, to save money, and B, to retain some control over the process and make sure it was properly drafted. But they were doing it in a rushed way to make sure it was passed before the uh, 2018 election. So because it was done in such a quick manner, I think you'll see that sort of um, effect through how this how this law has been implement, implemented. And most of you will probably already know this, but the way that the, the benefits are set up, it's it's not like sick sick leave or anything like that. It's not paid by the employer specifically or directly. The benefits will be funded through the state trust fund where employers um, will make payroll deductions and employer contributions in some combination to the trust fund. The trust fund will then receive applications from employees who think they need leave, um, evaluate those applications, and then pay out the wage replacement benefits. Employers can opt out if they provide an equivalent plan, and I'll get into all of those aspects in more detail a little bit later. Um, but you really do have to provide a plan that's providing the same level of benefits that somebody would be able to get through the state trust fund. Uh, this trust fund and the whole program will be operated by the Department of Family and Medical Leave, but it does get a little bit complicated because the Department of Revenue is also involved in taking in the um, the contributions and deductions and managing that aspect of the process. Uh, the coverage also extends to employees and independent contractors and self-employed individuals can opt in. Originally, the extension of this law to independent contractors appeared like it was going to be much larger than it actually has been. That's something the department has modified in, in recent times. And I'll get into that all a little bit more later. Um, but I think that's one of the most interesting and complicated things about the law that has been continuing to evolve. So first of all, coverage for employees, and sorry, coverage for employers. Virtually all Massachusetts employers with Massachusetts employees will be covered. And then on top of that, even if you don't have Massachusetts employees, if you have independent contractors in Massachusetts that meet certain qualifications, then you could be a covered business entity if your Massachusetts workforce is more than 50% uh, independent contractors. And that 50% number, I just wanna be clear, it's determined not based on payroll or anything like that, it's just sheer number. So if you have five independent contractors and two employees, you are a covered business entity and those independent contractors are covered. Now, again, as I mentioned, the independent contractor issue is somewhat complicated. I'll get into that a little bit later. In addition, smaller employers and, and covered business entities do get a break of deductions, but there's not an exemption like there is under the uh, the FMLA or anything like that, where if you have fewer than 50 employees, you're not covered. Under PFMLA, size is irrelevant. There's no threshold. If you have one employee, you are covered. There's a few limited exceptions though that I wanna go into, and they really are very limited. Uh, they pretty much track the unemployment statute, and in fact, that's what this is all based off of. Um, their definition of employer um, has been revised to parallel the unemployment statute. So as a general rule of thumb, if you or one of your employees is not covered under the unemployment statute, or if they are covered, then the, it'll be the same for the PFMLA. Um, and this is really something that the department has tried to push forward to make it a little bit easier to administrate this act. Um, so prior to the, this sort of effort to make the PFMLA consistent, with the unemployment statute. It was just state and local governments and their subdivisions and agencies that were completely excluded from the PFMLA. Now, uh, there are a wider range of excluded employment and excluded employers, but for the most part, it's really defined based on the, the work that's being performed rather than the entity that it is being performed for. So for instance, 
churches and, and certain religious organizations are excluded. But at the same time, uh, you know, you, you see commission only brokers, agents, um, student workers, certain visa holders are also excluded and they may work for an employer that still has to make contributions on behalf of the rest of their employees. So you really have to look at it on an employee by employee basis to see if they are covered. Speaking of employees, uh, for contributions and deductions, employees, sorry about that, <laughs> employees are generally covered when it comes to the deductions and contributions if they don't fall into the exceptions that I that I just previously discussed. However, they may not be eligible for benefits unless they meet the financial eligibility test. And that translates to you have to have earnings in the past 12 months that equal or exceed 30 times the weekly benefit amount you'd expect to receive. And in any event, your total earnings from the past 12 months have to be greater than $4,700. The, the, these earnings do not have to come from the same employer. And I want to make sure that this is clear because an employee can join your, your firm or your company um, and two weeks later, they could request leave under this law and they could be granted it because they worked at some other employer for the rest of the year. So the employee does not need to work at the same employer to be eligible for benefits. As long as they meet that earning test, they will be eligible. Now, I think the one really complicated issue with determining whether an employee is covered under the PFMLA is when you have employees who are not strictly based in Massachusetts. So um, again, this is an area where if they're covered under Massachusetts unemployment law, they'll probably be covered under the PFMLA. However, you have to be careful because sometimes there are interstate agreements on unemployment that just don't exist under PFMLA because this is such a new thing and a lot of states don't have PFMLA and haven't addressed this issue yet. Um, so in general, there's sort of a, a flow chart test. You first look at where the service is localized and that means basically you're performing all or essentially all of the services in a, in a specific area. And if the service is localized in Massachusetts, that's an easy answer. That employee is covered. So if you have someone who's living in New Hampshire, but they do 90% of their work in Massachusetts, they are probably covered. Next, if the service is localized anywhere else, so if you have an employee who works in New Hampshire most of the time, but lives in Massachusetts, they wouldn't be covered. But if you have somebody who's moving around in a, a bunch of different areas, you see this often with salespeople or you know, technicians um, who are doing house calls or something like that, where you're working at a bunch of different client sites or something, then you first look at where the base of operations is. So for instance, if we're talking about a cable technician and they are sent out from a home office in, um, northern Massachusetts, but they do some calls in New Hampshire. They would be localized in Massachusetts, even though they do that incidental work in New Hampshire, or even if it's not incidental, but they're still based out of Massachusetts, they would be covered by PFMLA. Of course, if you have the reverse situations and the base of operations is in a different state, like if they were um, based in New Hampshire, but being sent to different places, they would not be covered. Next, if there isn't a base of operations, um, you look at the place from which service is directed or controlled, same sort of analysis. Um, and lastly, if there isn't really a base of operations or a place where their service is directed or controlled, um, you look at residency. Excuse me. So if you have someone who's doing a lot of consulting and they're on projects all over the place and they're not really based in any office or something like that, um, then they are covered if they live in Massachusetts. It's a little bit different for independent contractors. Independent contractors have to live and work in Massachusetts. Um, in addition to meeting the financial eligibility test, 
and working for a covered business entity. So what this means is that if you have an independent contractor who is otherwise qualified under PFMLA to receive benefits, but the corporation they work for does not have 50% or more of their Massachusetts workforce as other in qualified independent contractors, then they will not be covered under the law. So originally it looked like independent contractors aside from the financial eligibility test and the covered and business entity test would essentially just be covered or not based on whether they were an individual and whether they received a 1099 tax form. Now, uh, fortunately, the department has clarified that and independent contractors, again, the unemployment statute, <laughs> independent contractors will not be included if they qualify as a properly classified independent contractor under the Massachusetts unemployment statute. And that test is essentially a version of the ABC test, if you've heard of that, um, where the individual has to be free from direction and control both under any contract that they have signed and as a matter of fact. They also have to perform services that is that are either um, outside of the regular course of business of the company they were performing for or performed off premises. And third, they also have to be operating their own independent trade or business. This is a pretty challenging test to meet, but it's actually easier than the test under the Wage Act because the Wage Act does not let you classify somebody as an independent contractor just because they're working offsite. <clears throat> Excuse me. So essentially now you can look at that test and if somebody is a properly classified independent contractor, you'll know that they are not covered under PFMLA. Now, if you are an independent contractor uh, and you are not qualified under PFMLA for any reason, you can still elect coverage under the law. However, you have to meet certain qualifications to do so. You have to have contributed to the fund for two of the last four completed quarters before you can seek benefits. So completed quarters, that means you paid all three months, not you start in the middle and um, then try to take benefits. And then on top of that, you have to commit to contribute for at least three years. And if you don't, they can seek back payments based on your failure to pay contributions, or they can seek the amount of benefits that they paid out. Another special issue that's sort of come up more frequently lately, and I think the department has been trying to address, is the issue of professional employment organizations. And if you haven't interacted with one, a PEO essentially serves as sort of HR sometimes, payroll sometimes, IT functions as well for, for small and medium businesses. So they can essentially outsource those hats to a separate organization that specializes in those functions. The problem with PEOs is that they are often the employer of record for taxes. So they will often take care of, you know, processing the payroll, paying the taxes, collecting and remitting and all of those things. Um, <clears throat> and they can, they'll also be the ones listed on the W-2 and all those forms. Um, the department has clarified that under PFML, PEOs should file um, for their clients if they are the employer of record for taxes. Um, but if they're filing on behalf of their clients, they shouldn't file a mass filing on behalf of all clients. They should differentiate it out. So if you are a PEO or you are a PEO's client, I would strongly encourage you to work with your counterpart um, to make sure that you are not double filing and that the proper filing does in fact occur. I think that's really the main priority in that situation is focusing on making sure that one and only one <laughs> filing is made. Oh, excuse me. Now onto contributions. Uh, again, this is hopefully something that shouldn't be news to most of you, but um, just to sort of go over this. Uh, originally, the contributions were supposed to start July of 2019, but there was a legislative agreement to extend the deadline until October 1st. Again, this is sort of relating to the whole rush to originally pass the law. I think we can sort of see that playing out here. Um, employers had to provide notice by September 30th. Um, 
but the exemption application deadline has also been extended to December 20th. So if you want to apply for an exemption that will be retroactively applicable starting October 1st of this year, you can still do that. Because they extended the deadline to October 1st, they also increased the contribution percentage so that the fund would be able to take in enough money to fund itself by the time it had to start paying out benefits. And that's why we saw it increase from 0.63% of wages to 0.75% of wages. It's still the same proportion of the 17.5% family leave contribution and the 82.5% medical leave contribution. And those contributions will be deducted on wages earned up to the social security cap, which I believe is now 132,900. I don't know what it's going up to next year, but it will adjust every year. And a, a quick note about that, because one of the aspects of the extension um, that I think a lot of people didn't necessarily realize is that the social security cap does not apply to all earnings that have been earned in the year to date. It, it only applies to earnings between October 1st and December 31st, 2019. So if somebody hit the social security cap on their regular earnings before October 1st or sometime during that period, they would still need deductions on earnings in that period. Fortunately, the, the extension still exempts employers with fewer than 25 workers from the medical leave portion. Otherwise, the employer will have to contribute 60% of the medical leave uh, contribution. But the weird thing is with small employers, that 60% essentially vanishes. So the employee and the employer, neither of them pay that portion. Um, but the employer can elect in any of these situations, no matter how large it is, to cover the proportion that the employee would regularly have to pay. And to sort of show this, I've, I've got a couple charts here that actually come from the department themselves. I think you know this helps make it a little bit clear because you're talking about 0.75%, 0.17.5%, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the way this shakes out, if you have more than 25 covered individuals, which again can be employees or independent contractors, depending on your situation. <clears throat> then the medical leave contribution is 0.62% of eligible wages. The employer will cover at least 60% of this and can cover up to 100, but the employee could cover up to 40% of this. Then the family leave contribution is 0.13% of eligible wages. The employer doesn't have to cover any of that, but the covered individual um, can cover up to 100%, and then the employer could contribute to that amount as well. And so the way that this works out, you have roughly equal contributions because the math I think is, um, the employer pays, I think it's 0.372% of eligible wages. And then the covered individual, if the employer doesn't pay any more than they have to, pays 0.378%. Of course, if you have fewer than 25 covered individuals, that 0.372% essentially just disappears. So then you have an effective contribution that's almost half of what it normally would be. So as I mentioned, um, the contributions and deductions should hopefully already be in place. Um, this is something that you will process through Mass Tax Connect, and if you pay taxes in Massachusetts, that should already be uh, set up for you, hopefully. I should probably mention I, I am not a tax attorney, so I don't specialize in tax questions. I, I try to address them as much as I can, but I am not a tax specialist. Um, but <clears throat> all of this should be uh, processed through, through Mass Tax Connect, and the department does have very helpful videos and explanations of how to set that up if, if you're not set up with that already. And if you are already on Mass Tax Connect, I believe they should have um, automatically set up an account for you. Now, um, even though you've already gotten set up and everything, you, you do need to continue to notify any new employees. Um, and if you don't have the posters up and if you haven't set, sent notices and posters up, 
you should do that as soon as possible. Uh, there's a template form on the department's website that's pretty easy to use. That's usually what I recommend people use unless they want to change it and send their own message. Um, <clears throat> there are fines if you fail, 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 <laughs> excuse me, if you fail to notify current or new employees. Um, and it's $50 per violation. So if you have, you know, 50 employees that can add up pretty quickly and then 30 per violation for any subsequent violations. And um, I haven't heard anything about enforcement actions yet. However, I would note the department has specifically set up a form for employee employees to submit uh, information on employers who have not provided notices or set up the posters. So it is, they're paying attention to this. Uh, this is something that they're invested in. And, you know, I, I would just be aware of that, um, you know, that they are looking out to see if people are actually upholding this obligation. Erin, I have a couple of questions um, that have been coming in. Yes, of course. I to uh, give you some time to get through. So uh, the first is, will the contribution percentage be lower in 2020 as the first full year? And then um, the second is, um, is it fewer than 25 total employees or fewer than 25 in Massachusetts? Um, okay, so in terms of the first question, it, we don't know what the rate is going to be for future years. The way it's set up that we'll look at it and evaluate what contribution rate they need in the future so they can change it. Um, we don't know if they're going to put it back or if they're going to keep it at 0.75%. I would expect they'd keep it at 0.75% for at least the next year. Um, regarding whether it's uh, 25 employees in Massachusetts or 25 overall, um, they are really only looking, I believe, at the the Massachusetts um, workforce and in this situation and, and that's what I've seen so far is that the calculation is really just Massachusetts W-2 employees and independent contractors that are considered under the law. Great. And there's one more question. I am just pulling it up. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, do posting posters count as notice or do we need to have the new employees the new employee oh geez I apologize um, employees my apologies. I'm going to try to get this a little bit bigger and then I'll, I'll come back again. Sorry, you can keep going and I'll... No worries. Um, if the question was whether you need to provide specific notices to employees or whether you can just put up the posters, I mean, that sounds like what was being asked. Um, I can address that very quickly. Um, essentially, you do need to provide individualized notices to all employees, both current employees as well as new employees. And you, you don't just need to provide them their specific notice. You have to provide them the opportunity to sign off or to acknowledge, um, refuse to acknowledge receipt of the notice. And so if you look at the templates on the department's website, they'll have a line at the bottom and two check boxes where it says acknowledge receipt or refuse to acknowledge receipt and a signature line for the employee. So really, um, the, the point of this is just making sure that you have a record that each individual employee has received the notice and that you've tried to give it to them and tried to get them to sign it. Great, thank you. And that was the question. I was <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> Great. Um, happy to help. Um, and okay, so back to contributions and deductions. Um, Unfortunately, and I mentioned I'm not a tax lawyer, but um, we're still waiting for tax tax guidance on how the contributions and deductions will be treated, um, both under federal law and um, there are upcoming regulations under state law. So 
uh, stay tuned in that respect. Right, uh, and in terms of, sorry, I keep doing that, the benefits. Um, now, the benefits that are available under PFMLA are the paid wage replacement benefits from the State Department, as well as the protected leave benefits. And as an employer, what the obligation is, is to provide the protected leave um, so that when the employee returns from, from their leave, they are able to return to their position unless it would have been eliminated anyway because of business necessity or a mass layoff or something like that. Um, now, the, the amount of leave benefits mostly parallels uh, FMLA. So if, if you are an employer covered by the FMLA, this should be somewhat straightforward. But if you're not, and I think you know it's mostly the smaller businesses who aren't already covered, uh, this, this might be a bit of an adjustment. Now the main difference between PFMLA and normal FMLA is that the employee can have up to 20 weeks for their own serious health condition. Uh, that's an extra eight weeks over the FMLA. Um, employees can also get uh, 12 weeks of paid leave for the birth or placement for adoption or placement for foster care of a new child. There are age restrictions on this, I believe, um, under 18 in most cases. And the family leave available is not just for birth or new child. It's also for the care of a family member's serious health condition. So if you have an older parent who um, needs your presence to take care of them, you can take up to 12 weeks off. Now for all of these, you will, the employees will need to provide certification to establish the need for leave. And, and in the case of a family member with a serious health condition, that will usually involve some statement from the doctor that you are necessary for their care. But um, it's still a, a new area of leave that's, that's available and that's available to all employees rather than those working for employers with 50 or more employees in the area. There's also military leave available and this is pretty much exactly the same as the FMLA. So uh, if an, a family member has a serious health condition that they incurred in active duty, the maximum amount of leave increases to 26 weeks and employees will also be eligible to take leave um, for qualifying exigencies arising out of a family member service. So this could be um, preparing to go on active duty or something like that. Now, the amount of the paid benefits, um, it, this is not full wage replacement. This is wage replacement up to a certain amount and it's a higher percentage of wage replacement for lower earning workers. So workers will get 80% of wages up to 50% of the state average weekly wage which um, I believe is something like 1300 or somewhere around then. Um, but let's say it's, it's 1000 for, for sake of examples. Um, if you earned you know, $1,000 normally on a weekly basis, you would get 80% of the first 500. So that would be $400 of wage replacement. Then 50% of wages beyond that first 500. So that would be an additional $250 up to a maximum amount of benefits that would be 64% of the state average weekly wage. And I think that amount is 850 now, but that's going to increase every year. Uh, and the, the state average weekly wage, I believe, is calculated by the unemployment, uh, the Division of Unemployment Assistance. Now, as I mentioned, oh, sorry, do we have more questions? We do. If the company offers a six month maternity paternity leave, a portion paid and non paid, does the employee receive the 12 weeks on top of the company leave or instead? That's a very good question. And the way that the regulations have set this up is that if an employer offers paid leave and the employee takes the paid leave, um, the employer would get reimbursement from the Department of Family and Medical Leave up to the amount of benefits that the employee received or would have received. So for instance, if an employee would have received $850 um, while taking the state pa paid medical leave or paid family leave, uh, that $850 would not be paid to the employee, it would be paid to the employer. 
Great, thank you. Great, um, and so just to sort of go back to what these leave benefits look like a little bit more, um, you know, again, the, the employer's obligation just with respect to the state leave is job protection, anti-retaliation, and most importantly, this one I think trips up a lot of people, especially if you haven't had to deal with the FMLA, health insurance continuation. So you do have to continue uh, an employee's health insurance related benefits. Um, so I believe this includes dental insurance and vision insurance as well as health insurance at the same rate that they were available while the employee was working. So you, you have to continue paying your portion of the premiums if you're an employer. And if you're an employee, your employer has to continue paying their portion of your premiums, but you also have to pay your portion of the premiums as well. So one thing to look out for is, is how the employee will pay those portions of the premiums because um, they'll be paid directly from the state if they're not paid through a private leave program or something like that. So uh, requesting leave, as I mentioned, the department is administering all of this. So the employee will apply directly to the impart, uh, department uh, at least 30 days out from expected leave or as soon as is practicable if they can't anticipate the need for leave. And they will have to also not notify the employer at the same time that they apply for leave. They will have to provide the start and end date, uh, the type of leave they expect to need, and the length. The department will process these claims and may require medical certification or other documentation, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, depending on the type of leave, it, it will vary somewhat. But you know, usually for medical leave, it'll be a certification from the doctor that this person is incapacitated from doing their normal duties or that they need intermittent leave or so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and I should just mention, for intermittent leave, um, that employers will be required to offer intermittent leave for most of these kinds of leave. However, uh, parental leave, leave for the arrival of a new child, uh, employers do not need to provide intermittent leave for that. They can agree with the employee to provide that leave, but it is not something they by law have to provide. Now, uh, if an employee applies for uh, paid leave benefits with the department and that request is denied for whatever reason they do have the right to appeal denial so it may take some time before uh, you are aware of whether or not you or your employee will be receiving leave unfortunately so i did mention this a little bit earlier but the pfmla regulations fortunately do address how pfmla is supposed to interact with different forms of other types of leave. So PFMLA will run concurrently with the normal FMLA under federal law, um, Massachusetts parental leave, which is the unpaid leave. Um, that's essentially not going to have much of an impact now because um, basically anybody who would be covered under Massachusetts parental leave should also be covered under PFMLA but it, it will still run concurrently, so you don't have to provide those additional unpaid leave amounts. Um, in addition, if somebody uses sick leave, they will uh, be able to have that run concurrently with their PFMLA. Um, you can allow employees to take accrued sick leave, vacation, personal days, other paid time off, but you do not have to require employee, you cannot require employees to do that. That has to be the employee's choice. Um, this is because it will be deducted from the amount of leave available to them. Now, uh, existing short-term disability and long-term disability plans will likely not qualify for exemption. So employers who offer these plans should look at whether or not they want to purchase a different form of insurance which I'll get into in a little bit, that will provide um, coverage that will allow you to apply for an exemption under PFMLA, um, or perhaps you can coordinate with your insurer to seek reimbursement of the short-term disability, long-term disability amounts paid out. Now, and as I mentioned before, employees who take paid leave, um, may continue to do so, uh, employer paid leave, like if you offer four weeks of paid parental leave, 
employees should can and should still take that amount but employees who choose to do that um, those amounts of paid leave must be reported to the department and that is the employer's obligation to report to the department unfortunately this is one of those areas where they're still developing their processes and and sort of clarifying how how this will happen but um, the understanding is that the employer will need to report the employee's use of paid leave that amount of paid leave used will be deducted from the employee's total amount of weeks of eligibility and then uh, the employer will be able to get re reimbursement now exemptions this is like i mentioned the most complicated part of this whole law uh, and it, it, you know it's it's been a bit of a struggle for those of us who have been trying to find a way to make exempt plans work and and those sorts of things um, in large part because we have this two-pronged system where you can be self-insured or you can have a private plan exemption but of course none of the existing private plans would qualify under PFMLA, so insurers have had to sort of catch up and create their own plans. And again, I'll get into that in a second. Um, but for the self-insured plans, initially, I think, you know, in June, they had had maybe a dozen applications that had um, come in for self-insured -exempt, self exempt plans and gotten accepted. And in part, that was because, um, A, the statute is so complicated and figuring out what you need to do as a, a private employer is complicated, but also because um, self-insured plan requires bonds. And at that time, they had not made any bond forms available. It was not clear if the bonds would be available in time for exemption applications to be submitted. Um, but in May, June, around that time, the department issued a update that they would not require bonds for self-insured exempt applications until the bond form was available. Now the bond form is available, um, but that that is a di an additional barrier for a lot of um, uh, companies because you do need to post a significant amount of bond. I believe it's uh, currently 71,000 um, per 25 employees. Um, although they modified the calculation somewhat. So, um, uh, but it, it is still a significant amount either way where you'd have to put that up in a bond. Um, and then you'd also have to administer the plan yourself. Although there are increasingly options to collaborate with uh, third party administrators so that they could cover the review of applications, certifications, medical record, those sorts of things. Um, there continue to be a few remaining questions in terms of um, what these exempt plans require. So one question that has come up a lot is whether there is a required procedure for processing these claims and the extent to which the procedures for processing claims must parallel the procedures that the department follows. Uh, there, there hasn't been a ton of clarity on that, and that's something that I anticipate we'll see more coverage of and more of a response to as things move forward. Another remaining question is whether or not, <clears throat> excuse me, whether or not plans need to cover former employees. Under the law, people who are recently unemployed uh, within the last 26 weeks can apply for paid leave benefits as long as they meet the earnings threshold. Um, but it's not clear if an employer who is offering an exempt plan would need to cover their former employees. And we really haven't gotten any guidance from the department on this. Now, uh, the other option, which I, uh, is becoming much more of a viable option and should hopefully be a lot easier for most employers, um, is the private plan exemption. Uh, like I said, uh, these plans are just starting to come on the market. There really weren't any before the law was passed, um, but they've, the, the Department of Family Leave, Family and Medical Leave has been working with insurers to develop compliant plans. And they're expecting to be able to come up with sort of a uniform compliant plan and so that um, people will essentially just be able to go out there, buy this plan, 
apply for an exemption if that's what they want to do. And the department has specifically provided a list of about a dozen approved carriers um, that will provide plans. Um, as of my last uh, check of their website this morning, they are still working on developing these plans and they have several meetings scheduled, even some today, uh, to work on developing these plans. Uh, but in the meantime, employers who want to apply for an exemption can uh, you know, work with the insurer, obtain a declaration of insurance and submit that instead of the insurance policy, which you would be required to submit in an ordinary exemption application. Now, um, there are a few practical considerations to consider here because essentially any policy uh, that you purchase will have to provide the same level of benefits. You'll still have to provide job protection. And so it's not clear that in the long run, the amount you would have to pay for such a policy or that an employer would have to pay for such a policy would be any better or worse than the state policy. Um, you also can't charge employees more than they would have to pay into the state anyway, so any extra cost goes straight to the employer. And the way that a lot of these carriers are dealing with this is that they're offering no payments until the benefits begin in 2021. So there's, there's a lot of savings to be had in the short term, but um, <clears throat> that can create a risk because you do need to hold on to these plans for a certain amount of time, I think through at least 2021, or else the department will seek back payment for contributions that you did not make to the fund during the time that you had the exemption. And um, that could be quite costly. And then on top of that, if you don't know what the rate of contribution is going to be when you start, it could be more expensive overall. I have a question. Yep. If your company's benefits include a medical plan that pays a certain amount of weeks, parentheses lump sum, to a person that has had a baby, does this negate that? Does, um, do the benefits from the paid family leave law eliminate the lump sum payment or does the payment count towards the weeks and they, the employer would get reimbursement? All right, so let's just, uh, this is, uh, this is from, Deborah Bender, let me see if I could just un Deborah, I've unmuted you. Can you can you clarify the uh, question? Oh, you you can actually say it. I've unmuted you. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Um, you can hear me. Okay. Uh, so will um, will the person now not be allowed to get that lump sum from the medical? So th that depends in part on the terms of the plan, but the way that I would expect this to work based on the regulations is that the person would still be awarded that amount of benefits, and then the Department of Family and Medical Leave would look at that award as an award of um, however many weeks of benefits that it was and say it was four weeks, the department would say, okay, you have four weeks of benefits. Now you can only get eight weeks through the state. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, it does. This, this is kind of, this is an offline uh, 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 part of the policy um, that they get for, I guess, a lump sum for six weeks for a normal pregnancy and seven weeks for, um, uh, C-section. So, uh, right, oh, I see. So they could still get it. Doesn't mean that they don't get it, but it gets kind of thrown into that bucket of what they get for, you know, when they're not working. And the pay, uh, the paid family medical leave will look at that. Yes, absolutely. If they're uh -huh. receiving paid leave benefits, the department will consider that and will just adjust their award accordingly. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Okay, um, so I was just gonna wrap up very quickly sort of what next, what we can expect moving forward. Um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of developments that are still ongoing, a lot of areas that still need to be pinned down and clarified, especially in the tax sphere. 
uh, we can expect there are proposed regulations about the administration and collection of um, the contributions and deductions, essentially treating it just as a regular payroll tax in Massachusetts. And um, I think the one interesting thing about the regulations is that they do charge interest on unpaid um, PFML con contributions. So that wasn't something that we had been aware of before. Um, <clears throat> We'll also expect to receive additional guidance from the IRS on the treatment of these benefits, and we should be seeing additional developments in the insurance market, including the production of a final policy that will comply. Um, hopefully, we will also continue to receive clarification from the department on the procedures for, for instance, reimbursement payments, uh, clarification on certain exemptions, as I mentioned, and so on and so forth. Uh, another thing that I think has come up a lot in discussions about PFMLA is whether we might see a federal law that covers this issue or makes PFMLA obsolete. It's not something I anticipate happening anytime soon. I think we will continue to see uh, a lot of other states pass um, Family and Medical Leave Acts, and so that might create some complications to the extent that there are all these different schema that employers have to work within. Um, so I think once we sort of reach a critical point with that, we might see a lot more of um, an impetus to, to set up a federal level um, system so that it's easier to navigate. Anyway, that um, is essentially all I have for you today. So if you do have other questions or there's anything else that you want to discuss about PFMLA, um, feel free to ask in the chat box or anything. I'm happy to, happy to discuss further. Thank you, Erin. And I'd also like to just make note that this is being recorded and we will have this available after the webinar is over. I should actually add also, if you do have questions that maybe didn't come up in this hour and you'd like to follow up, please uh, do not hesitate to send those over to me and I can pass those along to Erin. Give it another 10, 15 seconds. Oh, there we go. Yes, um, the slide deck will be shared. It'll all be part of the recording. Okay, well, it seems that those are uh, the last questions. And so Erin, thank you so much. Um, we do really enjoy our partnership with Foley HOAG. And I know this is something that will probably continue to pose a lot of questions for people as they navigate through. So we very much appreciate your time today. Of course, and thank you so much for having me. It was great being here this afternoon. Excellent, okay, everybody, have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.